phone home. And they'll come. Come home. The E.T. was a film I actually started thinking about while I was directing Close Encounters. And when the little alien goes back to the mothership, um, I just imagined what if he didn't? What if he stayed as a foreign exchange student? And then the entire story of that extraterrestrial opened up a whole kind of other alien idea for a movie, perhaps. Now, that's not where E.T. came from, but that was what I was thinking when I was making Close Encounters. There was another project I was writing and working on about divorce, and especially how divorce hits young kids, pre-teenagers, which is what I experienced when I was about 15, 16 years old, and my three sisters were pre-teens, you know, also experienced the divorce of my mom and dad, and I was going to write a movie about that, and what I simply did was I found a way to collapse both projects, both ideas, into the same screenplay. You know, if E.T. had been a reflection of my own upbringing uh, with all of my sibs, it would have been a lot louder, a lot noisier, a lot more overlapping dialogue, a lot more fights, <laughs> a lot more disagreements, a lot more just stir amongst, you know. And um, uh, so it wasn't. It was, it, was, it was polite. It was suburban. And it was almost like my dream of suburbia. And I grew up in the reality of suburbia, but there's also a kind of Norman Rockwell fantasy suburbia, which is where I said E.T., but I had years of fragments of ideas that I was putting together from 1976 until I finally had the story pretty much all in my mind and needed a screenwriter and went to Melissa Matheson, who was with Harrison Ford on Raiders of the Lost Ark, and asked Melissa if she would you know, consider collaborating with me on a script, which became E.T. And But I had all the story. Uh, pretty much I had the whole narrative plot in my head and Melissa helped me flesh out a lot of ideas that were just sort of percolating but not hadn't really boiled over yet. And so she was extremely helpful in, in helping me shape the final story. And then Melissa went off with hours of tape-recorded conversations and a lot of notes that she took. And she came back and she delivered maybe the, the best first draft I've ever read on any movie that I was about to direct. Hey, Elliot, where's your goblin? <laughs> Shut up. Did he come back? Well, did he? Yeah, he came back. But he's not a goblin. He's a spaceman. <laughs> I had always intended to tell the story from the point of view of kids. Uh, Close Encounters was told from the point of view of adults, but E.T. was going to be about kids. It was about the empowerment of that family, those kids in that family. And except for Mary, the mother, she was a kid herself in a sense, and that's why I photographed her. All the other adults are either silhouetted, shot at a long distance, or from the waist down until the critical moment where E.T. is dying, and then for the first time we see the character of Keys, played by Peter Coyote. But I just thought about this as a story that I probably could relate to as much as I had ever related to any story I had brought to the little screen in 8mm or the big screen with uh, Sugar Land and Jaws and the films I made after that. I was much closer to the, to the story. This was indeed my first personal movie, even though Close Encounters is often thought of because I wrote and directed that. But E.T. was really the most personal thing I had done as a director. And I had no expectations with E.T. I, I just didn't. Um, there's nothing that sets you up for failure or sets you up, you know, for falling down more than coming to a movie with any expectations at all. Movies are so fluid. You know, if I'm happy with the script, my only expectation is that I can make a movie as good as the screenplay. I don't ever expect to make a movie better than the script. I don't want to make a movie not as good as the script. And in that sense, I was much freer to improvise and to tap the wonders and the aptitude of these kids to make their own physical and verbal contributions to the plot, to the story, which they did daily. And, uh, and because there were no high expectations, there was no pressure. And it was like having a family. It was like 
behaving like a family. And I was the father of that family for a long time, for three months. I felt like I was, you know, Michael, Gertie, and Elliot's dad. Maybe he's some animal that wasn't supposed to live. You know, like those rabbits we saw that time. Green, orange, rain. red. Could be a monkey or a, a orangutan or A bald monkey? Is he a pig? He sure eats like one. I was really determined with E.T. to test the effects extensively, the mechanical effects, before I ever got to the floor, because I knew when I got to the floor, I was gonna be racing a clock. Drew Barrymore could only work between four and six hours, and Robert could work a few more hours, but as the kids' ages decreased, you know, I had fewer and fewer hours in a shooting day to work with the kids, and the movie's all about the kids. And I did not want the special effects to upstage that. I wanted all my attention to go on the performances, and to, to just understand that when E.T was expected to act, E.T. would be acting without my um, having to pull out my hair and run around screaming and yelling like I did on Jaws for nine months. I think when I first ran the film with Carol Littleton, the film editor, I think I knew at that point that this was a dream come true. I did never think I'd make a movie as good as E.T. That was my first reaction to seeing it. We, we did a lot of work after we screened it for the first time, cut another 40 minutes out of the picture, actually. But even long, I, I was, you're not supposed to fall in love with your own movie, but I fell in love with E.T. I fell in love with that picture. That was even without the John Williams score. That was very early in the process. But I also didn't imagine or couldn't imagine that anybody would be interested in seeing this picture except the Disney kids. And in those days, Disney films had lost their audience, were not as popular as they once had been. And Disney was a stigma in the early 80s. But I still felt that I had made a Disney film, and I was also pretty convinced that the box of his fate of E.T. would be the same as the box of his fate of many Disney films that had come out in the 70s and the very early 80s. So I wasn't really encouraged that I, I had made a commercial film, but I knew I had made a film that I would be able to live with comfortably for the rest of my life. But I didn't want to show it to the studio without an audience, so I invited the studio to see the film the first time I previewed the picture in Texas. And that was the only time I wanted the studio ever to see the picture. So it was scored, the color was corrected, it was a finished movie. The movie that the audience got to see months later was what the executives saw in Dallas for the first time. And their reaction was the same reaction as the audience. It was a, a brilliant, unprecedented reaction. I had never experienced anything like that except Jaws. But Jaws was filled with screams, and E.T. Was filled, was filled with laughter and, and, and some genuine tears but it was no less as robust as the Jaws screening, and so the studio came out of that flying high, as we all came out of it flying high. So it was a great night, a night I'll never forget, but even the studio came out not really expecting the film to be a gargantuan smash. They just knew that they had a good movie to market. But because the audience's reaction was so powerful for all of us in Texas, the next stop was the Cannes Film Festival during the closing night out of competition where we showed E.T. for the first time at the Palais with over a thousand people. And that was one for the record books, at least in terms of my own body of work. I've never had a reaction before or since to any movie the way the French reacted to E.T. That was really the first time I realized that we had an international movie. It worked in the States and now it was working abroad. And that was the first time I actually hoped that maybe we'd make our money back in a little bit more. I remember when President Reagan invited me to come to the White House to show E.T. to invited guests, and I, I took it to the White House and, and showed it to Nancy and Ronald Reagan and Supreme Court Justice. Sandra Day O'Connor was there. There's quite an event. And I just remember sneaking peeks at the president who was sitting directly next to me on my right and how the president's face became very childlike. His mouth was open, his eyes were wide, and I suddenly saw a 10-year-old boy, you know, um, sitting next to me. And, and, and that's what I think I focused mostly on, was, was, was how the president was uh, reacting to, the, to, to those images and the story that was obviously moving him. And it was kind of transformative, uh, for me anyway, to be able to get some aesthetic distance between myself and my own experience making E.T., where you get too close to the movie and you can't really see it anymore and you can't look at it the way an audience will see it. But in a way, looking at Reagan's face, you know, the most powerful leader of the free world, uh, having that kind of a reaction, I kind of went, hey man, film's pretty powerful, isn't it? Wow, film is a, uh, gee, look what it's doing to this guy. <laughs> that was a great experience. Remember how far I, I think it was 
around the block. I think it was, it was, wasn't it? At first, when the movie became such a phenomenon, I had a lot of pressure from the studio to make a sequel. And so, of course, I spent a couple of months doing exactly that, thinking about what Elliot's life was going to be like without E.T., and how would Elliot and E.T. ever, you know, come back into each other's lives. And when I couldn't find a satisfactory enough um, um, answer, I went to the studio and I just said, I think we made the perfect movie and I think it should end the way this ended and we should never revisit it again. And the studio agreed. I'll be right here. You know, I never thought of E.T. as a science fiction film. I saw this as a story about a family, a dysregulated family in disrepair after suffering the tragedy of divorce and how E.T. was able to give so much esteem back to Elliot and to Gertie and to Michael and in a sense pulled that family together and had given such a great gift to that broken family that when E.T. sadly flew off at the end, that family would never be the same in a good way. And, and E.T. was an ambassador for peace. And uh, that was the intention, and that's the role that E.T. played and continues to this day to play. Mm -hmm.